From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is A Way to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. There are a lot of good things I could say about having known Ken Drews for many years, and one of them is that we've had each other to talk to along the way while we've been writing each new book, someone to ruminate with and refine ideas with time and again. So when Ken started telling me more than a year ago about what is now his latest and his 20th book about fragrance, I was fascinated because, frankly, it's not something I know a lot about. So now, thanks to Ken and the sensual garden, as in S-C-E-N-T, meaning fragrance, the title of the new book, I do. And more in a moment, but first this message. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. TimberPress.com What kind of scents please you or don't? How do you even describe what things in the garden smell like? Well, Ken Drews, author of the new book, The Sensual Garden, is here to talk about all that and more. Hi, Ken. Oh, Margaret, what a nice introduction. Oh, I just pretended that that was all true, you know. (laughs) Um, But no, seriously, I mean, you know, we've read and talked about and developed ideas. You know, we've told each other, we've confessed, I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about that. What do you think about this? We've done that for a few years now. (laughs) uh, Just a few, right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so thank you for the new book and and you know for really forgetting me to even think about this because I have to say I, you know, I could tell you which plants in my garden have a scent that I like, but that's not why I got them. It's not that I was motivated by it. So, I want to hear more about how this all came about. But first, I'll just say we will have a book giveaway with this with the transcript of this show, Ooh. so people can look for that on awaytogarden.com. And it is beautiful. The book thank and big. You. So why did you want to tackle the topic of scent in a book? Because it's not an easy thing to talk about smells. <laughs> well, that actually, that's kind of the reason I wanted to do it. Because, I, well, I love fragrance, and I have a, a rather acute sense of smell. Uh-huh. And, uh, it, well, whenever I go to any, whenever I meet any flower, no matter what, even if it's a dahlia, and I think, that's not going to smell. I have to smell it and check it out and test it. And when I find something that smells, it's just wonderful. It's like a, another dimension to me. And when I see something like a rose that doesn't smell, um, that's a letdown for me anyway. Right. But, you know, I look in the catalogs. Some of the best catalogs are on some of the websites that describe plants, even the best ones. And when it comes to smell, it says fragrant. or right. it's doesn't say anything. Right, right, right. It, and I yeah. wanted to know what what it smells like or how to des- how can one describe that? And that's what I set out to do is to to describe fragrances of many plant well, plants that I love. It was interesting for me I recently um, since I first read your book as you were kind of working on it and then read it just when it you know I got my early copy recently. Um, I've also been reading this other new book, not a garden book at all. Um, what's it called? Uh, the Way Through the Woods on Mushrooms and Mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, a woman oh whose my. husband died and she took up mycology, amateur mycology. You know, she took up mushrooming, right, going mushrooming. And one of the things, uh, you know, to kind of distract her from the grief and whatever, and it's a beautiful book. Um, but one of the – this whole section in it, one of the things that mycologists do when they're trying to ID a mushroom is they – First, they pass it around, they slice it, and they smell it. Everyone smells it and mm-hmm. agree. And the same thing, it was exactly what you had talked about, is how do we put this into words? It's no, There's no language for it. Well, I, it's, it's interesting, that, interesting that you say that because I've read that, and I haven't experienced it myself, but some mushrooms smell like chocolate. It's uh, you don't think you, just, you think of that sort of musty, earthy right. smell of the mushrooms you buy right. at the store, which is good too, uh, mossy, earthy smell. But uh, I've read that some mushrooms. 
Well, actually, some mushrooms we even know have fragrances. I should check that out. Yeah. Good thing to think about. Yeah, so it was kind of, it was like, I thought, oh, Ken will love this. Ken will, I'm, I'm, I'll send you a copy of the book. But it's like, oh, Ken it's will love this. Ken will love this because it's just the same kind of, you You said, I want to write about this. I want to explore this. And then it was like, where are the words? What are the words to use for this? So you did have to, because it's a book, you did have to come up with a, um, a language for it. So mm-hmm. what did you do? Like, Well, I've, I found that mostly I had to use analogies. You know, with colors, there's so many words for colors, yes. like cerise and stuff. And there's even words that come from plants, like cherry. Right. And all sorts of things. But for fragrance, I can say sour, maybe, or tart, uh, or pungent. But then you have to say like coconut or something that people would know, you know, vanilla scented or Mm -hmm. smells like yellow cake when you were a kid, Mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. And there are flowers that smell like yellow cake when you were a kid. (laughs) So so you tried to get as descriptive to conjure something that people could then sense the smell, even just reading about it by the language mm-hmm. you chose, right? And it's, it's somewhat subjective, you know, different right. senses of smell smell a little differently. But I, I would, in the book, I have a lot of things about how smell works and things like that. And then there's a, an encyclopedia of well over 100 plants and flowers and parts of plants, it's herbs too. And I try to describe them and I have the primary scent uh, within categories, and we can talk about that too. Mm-hmm. And then the secondary scents, because some things like hyacinths, some people don't like the smell of hyacinths, but to, I started a list of what it smells like, and oh, there's a little bit of this and that, and a little bit of that and this, and right. it, it, it's probably got six different things that I can pick up in there. Now, when you say pick up, that's not just by taking one big whiff, is it? I mean, no. Right. You know, I can't say anesthetize. Okay, help me out here. <laughs> anesthetize? <laughs> and like in, from anesthesia, well, you, anesthetizes? Yes. Uh-huh. You become accustomed to yes. the smell. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I don't know. I read it when I was doing research that they, I don't know if they still do this. I've never experienced it. But they used to have bowls of coffee beans in the in the you know, like at Macy's and stuff in department stores. So when you went through the perfume oh. area and you wanted, they would reset your smell receptors with coffee beans. That's hysterical. <laughs> as the, sort of the baseline. But as I, as I was doing the research, I, I found out that perfumers use the inside of their elbow. They just smell the crook of their elbow because oh. you're accustomed to your own smell and it resets your smell receptors. Okay. All right. Good. So, so. Um, anyway, little sniffs. Yeah, so little <laughs> sniffs. We, we should sort that. of sip it, sip the smell, right? Not, right. not, not um, uh, drink it down all at once. Um, now, plants. So, so you I, before we leave that subject of like the language, you came up with how many categories? Sort of these overall categories. There, there are twelve categories 12, right, of right. fragrance, and so, they yeah. were kind of based on what perfumers use and what I thought about. Uh huh. So get some examples, just some examples. Well, the they're alphabetical. Okay. And the first one is animalic, which are things that have sort of animal smells like skunk cabbage. Right. Which is kind of skunky. Right. And I don't know if you've ever experienced ginkgo fruits. Oh, please. <laughs> or, well, did you ever cut fritillaria and put them in a vase? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of foxy. So animalic, okay. Animal-like-ish. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Then I have balsamic resinous, mm-hmm. and it's not like the vinegar. The vinegar is like it. Mm-hmm. So it's resins that are not conifers, not piney resins. Uh, and that, that goes way back to the frankincense and myrrh. But things that are balsamic resinous uh, includes caramel and vanilla. Mm-hmm. And then I have floral sweet, which is really where everything else goes. Uh, when things are like mock orange or right. primroses, uh, and you really do want to say sweet. I tried not to say sweet <laughs> because yeah, it's white, too hard. White sugar doesn't smell like anything. Right, right. But I have a floral sweet section for all those other things that, and like daylilies too. You know, they're they're floral and they're sweet. Mm-hmm. But, they don't fit into animalic and they don't fit into 
fruity exactly. Then I have forest, which mm -hmm. is the coniferous sense, but it goes from rosemary to pine, all the way down to those mushrooms on the earth. Right. <clears throat> and fruity, which are things that actually may be fruits, like uh, citrus fruits or citrus leaves have a different smell. Um, freesia is kind of fruity. Pineapple sage, right. of course, got its name. Bearded iris are often grape soda smelling, mm -hmm. tall bearded iris. Then I have the heavy ones, like I know one of your favorites, the oriental lily. <laughs> oh, please, please get me away from those. I, that's too much I, for me. I can't, I can't, it's, it's too, too intense for me. I, I heard one of the children's voices in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> oh, oh, Pip, come on. Pippa, hello, Pippa. Um, so, so okay, so heavy stuff, right, and I'm not crazy about that. And what's the next category? Well, I'm uh, oh, sorry. You know, Orient, Oriental Lily is one of your favorites, and I was just thinking as since I – that's one of the ones I have – my list has burned sugar, indole, we could talk about that, honey, vanilla, baby powder, anise, grapefruit, and clove. That's what I pick up in that oriental lily. And then at 5 o'clock, it gets stronger. Right, <laughs> right. Which is terrible for you. Herbal green, things like anise. Right. Anise hyssop and, uh, well, licorice-smelling things, hay-scented fern. Yeah. Oregano. Honey, a lot of things smell like honey, yep. like sweet alyssum. Yep. That's like super honey. Uh, indolic, and indole is a compound, a molecular compound, and that compound is in a lot of flower smells, and it's kind of like mothballs. And that sounds terrible, but if you smell something sweet and nice, if you keep sn sniffing like that, you'll pick up that mothball in the background, hmm. and that's indole. Then there's the things that are medicinal smelling, like artemisia and eucalyptus and even salvia. I love and those. Those are the ones I love, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, that's my thing, yeah. And then there's roses, of course. And mm -hmm. gosh, I could have done, you know, another three books on roses yeah. alone. But yeah. roses, and I have old roses and modern roses and what they smell like. And the last category is spice. Spice, uh huh. So I put things in there like dianthus that smell like spice. Well, they smell like clove uh -huh. <laughs> because yeah, they yeah. have eugenol, which is the same spice that's in clove, yeah. same same compound. And one of your favorite plants, geranium macorrhizum, I put that in spice. Yes, I love the things with a spicy or the um, medicinal. The the pungent foliage especially. I'm more That's a foliage person than a flower person. In, in, in terms of the scents, I like them. Um, so, okay, so there's this diversity of scents and then you have sort of sub scents within each one. If we sip the fragrance a little mm -hmm. bit at a time, we may smell five different elements in, in the, the first impression and then other impressions. But plants didn't come up with fragrance so that we could enjoy it or loathe it in the case of some of them. No, it's a coincidence. <laughs> so so this is not for us, right? I mean... No, it's for the pollinator. Well, you know, I was going to say it's for the pollinators. And in the case of the nice-smelling flowers, well, on all the flowers, really, it's for pollinators. Something that smells like dead meat is for the flies right. to come and pollinate Different it. pollinators, right. Right. And but so, often yeah. with the... I was going to say just with the herbs that have those smells, medicinal smells that you like, yeah. predators don't tend to like yeah, those. Yeah, it's anti-predation. Right, right, right. 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 So, so um, and, and some plants are, you mentioned uh, one just a minute ago, are scented or more strongly scented in the evening. And that's also not for us to put by our patio, although we could if we sit out on our patio in the evening. But that's not why it was... It evolved that way. It's it's another strategy, right? For nighttime pollinators, for instance, like maybe it's moth like moths, pollinated, right. right? Okay, and or bats sometimes, right? Right. Uh, it, for the right plants, and a lot of those plants are white because they reflect the moonlight uh, to attract them by sight as well as by fragrance. Right. So in doing this book, you did some, you know, kind of experiments and stuff like and you, you did some sort of crafty things and, you, you know, you kind of went on a lot of adventures, didn't you? Well, I was I'm not I don't like perfume. I don't like air fresheners. I like the natural things. Mm -hmm. 
but I thought, can I can I capture some of this? And I read a lot about how different different perfume, well, essential oils are extracted. S- sometimes it's just squeezing a lemon rind, and everyone's done that, and the oil comes out, and that's your your lemon fragrance. Right. Uh, then there's some flowers are they use solvents, chemical solvents. Sometimes CO2 is used as a safe chemical solvent. Uh, flavors tend to use have water as a solvent, but fragrances use oil as a solvent mm-hmm. often. Uh, people used to steep fragrant things in oil, and of course we make vinegars with, with herbs. Right. Um, burning, like incense, that's mm-hmm. another way of getting the capturing a scent. Distillation is often used for things that can stand up to heat. But there's a there's something that used to be done with delicate flowers, and it's called enfleurage, and it was done in the 1700s, and it's still occasionally done, and that uses well, they used to use animal fat, like uh, lard or tallow, uh-huh. and they'd spread animal fat in a thin layer on sheets of glass in a frame, and then they'd press petals of like a rose or oh. tuberose or oh. jasmine into this fat, then lift them off and replace them and do that for two weeks straight and then scrape off the oil and they would either use it that way or they would use alcohol to remove the essential oils from the fat. So I I wasn't about to do that and I don't have enough flower petals, but I, I spread, I melted some vegetable shortening in a pan and press the petals of my favorite rose, old rose in the garden, which is called Petite de Hollande from 1720. It's an amazing fragrance, very strong. And I press them into the shortening and covered that with another pan and put it in a dark place for 24 hours. Lifted off the pan, pulled out the petals, and I had the fragrance of my favorite rose from early June to January. In the residual oil. In right world. in the jar, ah. and then it kind kind of faded, but uh-huh. I had it in January. Huh. All right. So you kind of, yeah, that's kind of fun. Is that preserving? It's crafty. Can, <laughs> can we preserve the the fragrance? Right. Um. Mm-hmm. So so into the garden, you know. Um, you you have fragrant plants. You you have a lot of things that you grow indoors as well. So indoors and out. I mean, are there plants that, in doing this book, you realized you right away? You know. I've, got to showcase this plant or that plant. You know, there's some favorites or some you, I couldn't live without because you said you feel like when you go out into uh, somewhere and you see you meet a plant and you put your nose to the flower, if it doesn't have a scent, it's lacking. So like what, what are, are there some Ken's favorites in this book showcased? Uh, a million? Yeah, a million. Uh-huh. Um, I like Jasminum sambac. Do you know what that is? Uh huh. Jasminum Arabian, sambac. Uh-huh. Yeah, jazz. Uh, the Arabian jasmine. I love that. And jasmine is not so easy to grow in the house, but that one is. It's not mm-hmm. the prettiest plant, but it blooms. And tiny flowers that can fill a room. One flower. Uh, you know, outdoors. I am wild about calycanthus. Yes, and this is a plant that I'm seeing. Uh, like our friends at Broken Hour Nursery and some other choice nurseries, I'm seeing it more and there's more selections, the flower color, size of the shrub. Um, they don't all smell. No, no. But it, it, what, what's the common name for it? Is it some like Carolina Carolina Allspice? Allspice, Allspice yeah. Calicanthus. And it's a native shrub. Uh, I don't remember to what regions of the country specifically. It's um, sort of southern, but there's a California species as well. Yeah. And there's – some of them have uh, – a dark reddish flower, and I think some have. Do some have white? Did I make that up? Or there, okay. the there's a white one called Venus, because mm-hmm. they're mostly. And you'll remember this because this happened in your lifetime with people you know. But Dan Hinckley found uh, calycanthus. Well, it was called cyanocalycanthus because mm-hmm. they thought it was a different genus, but it turns out that it wasn't. So it's calycanthus sinensis, which has beautiful flowers. But they are not fragrant, but that contributed to the hybrids that we now see, the big flowers, the I white see. flowers. Uh, and I think – if I, oh, I hope they're not listening, but I think my favorite is Athens, which Athens. has chartreuse mm-hmm. flowers. Right. And they smell like green apples and honeydew melons. 
it's it smells a little bit and it attracts a beetle that climbs inside the flower that while well, it's still closed and then it can't get out and then for one day it doesn't smell and then it opens up and it smells again to attract the next beetle for to deliver the pollen mm. all these things are just amazing and if the humidity is right at five o'clock in the afternoon i can smell that calicanthus from about 40 feet away yeah yeah, no, and it's that's a wonderful right. smell. But everybody describes that plant differently. Yeah, um, I mean those red ones. I think they're whiskey barrel huh. or lacquer thinner. Oh, funny! That's a, that's a game I play when when guests come. And what do things bloom. smell like to you? Yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah. Bubble gum. Yeah, yeah. Crushed strawberry. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and so, so many different things that um, I mean the the fragrance, like for instance, hostas. I mean, there are some hostas in the last couple minutes, maybe even among familiar plants. Uh, there's a lot of breeding going on in hostas. I think to accentuate the genetics that include fragrance. Yes. Seems like there's just one species of hosta that smells, which is hosta plantaginea. Yes. But now they've hybridized. There's dozens. And if you find a hosta that has plantaginea in its ancestry, it will be fragrant. And there's a list in the book of about 20 fragrant hostas, but there's more coming out all the time. Guacamole, you know. Mm -hmm. Are they often <laughs> the white? Have the, often white flowers? The, uh, yeah, well, plantaginea you know, is white. I think they would be. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. And there's plantaginea grandiflora. grandiflora I know yeah. you know those at Wave Hill. They're so beautiful. Yes. those are very late. They bloom in August. Yes. Yeah. But some of them do have the a little bit of the purplish in them. But the flowers are almost always open. You know, mm -hmm. ho some hosta flowers never seem to open, but the plantaginea open, and the pollinators love them, and I love them too. And even daylilies. Um, Daylilies are, to me, they almost all the older daylilies smell, and most of the funky hybrids with their pie crust edges don't seem to smell. Although I have a double one, yellow double one that does smell wonderful, and from far away too. But the yellows to me seem to not only smell best, they taste best. <laughs> you like to eat them. I do. I I eat them in salads. The Chinese people, that's what they say. You know, the Chinese. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, stir fry the buds but I can't sacrifice the flowers so I, I pick the flowers especially of old ones like Hyperion a yellow one that smells so wonderful and I just shred the petals and put it in the salad and it's beautiful and tastes delicious <laughs> um, I was surprised to see um, echinaceas some of them are in the spice section I think of the, the chapter about spice yes so weird you know purple cone flower. I never thought they smelled, but when they started having all these different ones, and now you know there's so many different ones, all these colors, yes, uh, which are their Echinacea purpurea with Echinacea, uh, you know, it has the name of not being purple. <laughs> yeah, I don't remember what it's called either, but I, I'll remember after we hang up. <laughs> I know. Instantly. I was going to say palette, and it's not that. No. It's like Confusa or something. Oh. Uh, it's not that either. But th those colorful ones, they smell to me like something I grew up with, constant comment tea. They yes, have a kind yes, of cinnamon, yes. Yes. Uh, clove, and orange scent, and often hay. Either hay, hay go into orange and clove. Hmm. And a lot of them smell. There's, and now I even see there's a, one, there's a couple that have fragrance in their names, in their hybrid names. Huh. Um, yeah, because I, I never even thought, frankly, to – put my nose to them and see if they smelled because it, do you know what I mean? I don't think of it as like, oh, echinacea, comb flower, it's a scented flower. I, I never thought about that. Um, and they didn't used to be. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, um, well, there's so many different things to talk about in the book, The Sensual Garden. Um, uh, I was thinking that maybe during catalog shopping season, Ken, which begins in December-ish, say, and goes into the new year, I thought it would be kind of fun if you would be willing to do another visit to the show, I thought it'd be fun to shop the catalogs together with a nose to scent, you know, as opposed to just the pretty <laughs> pictures, but... A nod to nose to scent? Don't you think that could be fun? I do. I do that. Okay. So let's let's plan to uh, to, to have a date to do that, okay? Okay. And sounds con great. congratulations, number 20, book number 20. Oh, Good for you. Yes, we'll have you. a giveaway, as I said, and I'll talk to you soon. 
That's wonderful. Thank okay. you. Underwriting support from Timber Press, your go-to resource for books and gardening and nature. Whether you're a new gardener, a professional at the top of your field, or a reader interested in the wonders of the natural world, their books are there to help you grow. Timberpress.com. And I'll talk to all the rest of you soon again, I hope. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook and Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.